Okay, welcome back to Conspiracy Cafe. We had to give a little break to Mary to Judy. rest a Oh, pardon me, to Judy uh, Very. I get uh, my words crossed from sometimes. A lot of Marys in my life, like my grandmothers. So uh, we're back, and we'd like to continue a little bit. You were just starting to get into Lee and really getting, uh, getting going and giving us some good information about him and what he stood for, what he believed in. Uh, you know, maybe you can elaborate some of his special assignments that you may have known about uh, or uh, yeah, and some I, of the work I, he did. I've got an interesting book here. Can everybody see it? How would I show everybody Just this like book? that. This is the very first book. This was given to me just yesterday. This is the very first book that was ever written about Oswald and the assassination. And right away, I mean, this is published in 1964, early in 1964. And I have been telling people how could you have a man go from Soviet Russia, where he'd been almost three years, enter the United States and not get arrested? Because it was the height of the Cold War. And I had people tell me, oh, well, maybe that wasn't that way back then, you know, because they don't understand. So what's wonderful, I'd like to read a passage oh, from do. this book. Very first book that comes out. And by the way, here, here it goes. It's just something else. It says, Oswald's defection compromised all their secret radio frequencies, call signs, and authentic, authentic, authentication codes. I, by the way, I've been hurt, and I have double vision, so you have to put up with my reading. He knew the location of every unit on the West Coast and the radar capability of every installation. We had to spend several thousand man hours changing everything and verifying the destruction of the codes. Oswald was a very unpopular man that month. This statement clearly shows that Oswald was engaged in top secret work. Had he been a genuine defector, had he really betrayed to the Soviets all their, those radio frequencies, then he certainly would have been liable for immediate prosecution and the stiffest penalties after his return to the United States in 1962. Yet he was never arrested or prosecuted for this alleged treason. Well, I'll tell you, he was sent there on purpose to bring down the U-2, and that's why they wouldn't pr persecute him, prosecute him when he came back. All right, it says he was never arrested. All right, why not? The answer is obvious. The whole defection was a smokescreen. Lieutenant Donovan says it was the authority for the fact that Oswald publicly read Russian newspapers and so on and so forth. So you have a lot of firsthand information. This hasn't been filtered through, uh, you know, years and years and years of uh, propaganda and so on. Yes, Lee Oswald should have been arrested, but he was not. Well, look at the modern comparison. The soldier who gave information that led to WikiLeaks is behind bars. That's right. He's not going anywhere. Yeah. So if you said that he did this, like, I'm half yeah, Polish. Yeah, he, he was a WikiLeak guy of his time. Exactly. I'm Soviet half Union. Polish. We knew what the Cold War was. Took a long time to get past the frontiers from a communist country to come to the West or vice versa. If you went to Poland, you were followed. You were, you know, you were treated like you were a CIA spy if you came to Canada. Well, good luck. And, uh, you know, never mind that you're, he got his passport in, what, two days to go you're not to, gonna believe uh, this. to Russia or something? I was even there when he got his passport, when he showed me his passport the same day he got it. He made the application for his passport on June 24th, 1963. He got his passport on June 25, 1963, less than 24 hours, what they say, 24 hours. I met the man who did it. It's a, it's a fascinating story how Lee had connections with customs agents and one of them was flown in from Miami, Florida to expedite his passport and a bunch of others so it wouldn't be noticed, maybe 10 or 15 others with it, all in one day. And yet the passport said on it that he intended to go to Finland, Russia, uh, all kinds of Soviet sector countries, and he still gets the okay in 24 hours in a port of entry. And I, when you have a port of entry uh, place like New Orleans, all the time they were looking for spies that were coming in from Castro's Cuba, coming in through Mexico, Mexico City, and all the way across the border that way. They go come from uh, by ship. Uh, they were watching all the time, and they were turning down passports uh, applications by the handful of suspicious people. But Lee Oswald, with his Russian wife and his kid, you know, he can come in, ask for his passport, because he didn't, you know why? He, his other passport hadn't even expired but it was stamped with all kinds of USSR uh, things all over it. So, you know, he wanted a clean passport so that when he went anywhere, it wouldn't be noticed, at least at first, where he had been. He gets it immediately. Now, how did he manage? 
well, I was there and met Charles Thomas, who did it. He called himself Arthur Young for this project. And if you look on a passport application, you can hardly read the signature of the man, but you can see it's Young if you look carefully. But there isn't, wasn't any Young that was in the passport office working there. Okay. Anyway, uh, that family is one of my witnesses. We have another witness. Her name was Anna Lewis. She's just recently died, guess what, of lung cancer. Okay. Uh, she managed to live uh, 10 years after speaking out. They threatened her. They, she lost her job for a year and a half. Um, she was a security uh, agent and all that kind of thing, you know, security guard. Um, she refused to, to back down, you know, because she and her husband and Lee and I, we double dated in New Orleans. We walked the streets together in New Orleans, went to Old Preservation Hall and everything. She knew I, that Lee and I were lovers. Lee and I had miserable marriages, okay? And if you read in the book, you'll see what happened, why we did what we did. It wasn't that we were, had no morals, we did. In fact, it took us quite a while to uh, make that leap, in, you know, into bed together. And we did it because we loved each other. We, we fell in love with each, other, with each other right away. I'm, I'm very tired, and I forgive, forgive me, it's a little late for me. Um, I come from, uh, you know, exile in Europe where it's six hours later. So you can imagine the time difference for me now. It's, for me, it's 3 o'clock and 3.30 in the morning. Some of our fans in Europe stay up to listen. Well, that's wonderful. God <laughs> bless you all. And in Europe, I'm, I've been treated wonderfully, but um, I've, had, I've had problems there, too. I, when I went to Hungary and tried to teach there, I was teaching one day, and you know what happened to me. Uh, they called and said, we can't have you teaching here anymore. They're going to burn down our school if you, <laughs> you know. Well, that was one threat. They, didn't, they, were, they changed their actual cell phone number so, so I couldn't reach them anymore. And then they, uh, the people who had placed me there, they drove all the way and took me back to Budapest. I'm in Budapest, and I, I buy a ticket to the United States to go home, you know, because they told, I was told by a woman who approached me, she said she was with the Hungarian Secret Service. That, by the way, this happened in 2007. You know when it happened? It happened on September 10th, 2007. They told me to get out of the country by September 11th, or I'd die. And it scared me to death, of course, and I had so little, I mean, I had very little money because I just started teaching. It took everything, a lot of money I had just to move there. I'd been persecuted in the United States. I lost my jobs and everything. I, I had to make money somehow and teach, and I wanted to teach. I love teaching. So anyway, I go and buy my ticket, you know, but they can't print it out because they ran out of paper. So I come back in, in a couple hours, you know, get pick up your ticket, you know, off the Internet. So I was on the uh, way back to the hotel, and I'm going to get my stuff, you know, because I know I'm going to get on the plane, just a couple hours. And then second agent gets on the, the tram with me, and she says, I have to tell you something. She says, you should not go to America. Now, how did she know I was going to go to America anyway? She said, when you get off the plane at Newark, you're not, they're not, you're not going to be able to get out of customs. You're going to be vanished. And the, I, it was hard to believe. I, you see, I, it was very hard for me to believe. By the way, my book had just been finished and it was going to go to a publisher. Okay? And uh, so I went back. I didn't believe her because I was going to get off at JFK and then from there go on to uh, where my daughter lived. Okay? And, and then I would go on to this job offer I had lined up in just a couple days. So I go and get my ticket, get print out. I didn't believe her. By the way, she said, don't tell anybody who I am. And she said, you know, your, your family was Hungarian, and, and some of your family helped us during the Hungarian Revolution. That's why we're risking our necks to tell you about this. And she said, by the way, did you know that your hotel is right across the street from an FBI office? And I, I figured, I, I checked that out, and it was true. What's the FBI doing in, in, in Hungary? I'd like to know. Same thing they do in Toronto. They're supposed to be in domestic. <laughs> they're not supposed to be over there. But there they were. I came into my room. You know, it had been broken into. People were leaving. They were scared to death. A big man had busted right there. I've got photographs of what they did to my door. All my things were missing. They took everything. He took everything, hauled it out while everybody's watching. And they told me he's about six foot four, you know, great big burly guy. Just smashed open the door. I've got pictures of them repairing the door and, and trying to put new hardware on the door because he just smashed in. 
and everybody was leaving. They were telling me, no, no, nothing happened. They said, are you crazy? We saw what happened. They, they were leaving. They weren't going to you know, have him hurt them, but that was just to scare me to death. But they did take all my stuff. So I go back with only, I thank God I had my computer with me, you know, I carried with me to um, get my airline, my ticket, because I plugged in at a, an internet cafe, you know. So I go back, get my ticket printed out. Dear God, it said that it changed it from JFK to Newark. It just gave me chills. So I bought a couple of tickets in different directions because I was scared. And one of them I bought was to Sweden. And I went there and I applied for political asylum. And they said, lady, are you crazy? What are you, what are you talking about? You can't do this. I mean, you're from the land of the free and the home of the brave, and you're not on our list. You know, countries, we take people from Iraq, you know, and Somalia, and, and you're from the United States. Uh, we're going to send you back, back to Hungary anyway, because the EU law is that uh, whatever EU country you came from, you know, that's where they're going to go and get your political asylum there. I said, they told me to leave or I'd die. And now it's September 11th. Well, because it was September 11th, maybe, okay, that, that's when I arrived in Sweden, they, w they went ahead and called Hungary. And first they said, well, we're going to keep you five days. We're not going to deport you right away. Next thing I knew, they'd called someone else, you know, there. Now they moved me to a city, okay. But in that city, I was followed, photographed, and because I had other uh, refugees with me and everything. Uh, it, it, they stood up for me and told, told them. Then they moved me to a very small town and to change my name because I was being followed even in Sweden. It didn't matter. By then, we had the manuscript. was sent to Trine Day. They took two years. By 2010, it was printed. So you, isn't it wonderful, the nice noises of civilization that we hear outside? Yes. Those are symptoms. I like the loons and the birds, but... Uh, yeah, well, those are the <laughs> symptoms of what's wrong with our society. It, it doesn't even sound human. We used to have, I don't do 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 was at least a little bit melodious. Now it's just, it's just a honk, isn't it? Yes. In the night. Okay, so back to Lee Oswald. I'm the one who knew who he was. He didn't have anyone to confide in, really, that he could really trust. He had penetrated... A, a, the same people who wanted to kill Castro, they had a killing machine now. And they, were, they, they, they got our bins, you know. They got others. And now they were after um, Castro. And when they found out they really couldn't do that, they, all of them hated Kennedy. The same batch hated Kennedy. The man who was the head of this killing machine at this time was David Atlee Phillips, CIA operative. And uh, very interesting man, Lee told me. He was behind this. Phillips is on record of bragging that he went to Kennedy's grave, looked down on it, and urinated on it. That's the kind of man he is, or was. Interestingly, he died of cancer, too. We had a lot of these people wiped out with cancer. I, uh, Jackie Kennedy, of course, died of lung cancer. You have poor Ted Kennedy dying of brain cancer. It's very interesting. I mean, isn't there any other disease in the world these people can die from? You know, you wonder. Well, Dad always said when you work for evil, the only bad thing is the retirement policy. You never <laughs> live to see it. So that's a good incentive to toe the straight line because they'll use you, and when they're done with you, they'll kill you too or make your life so miserable you wish you were dead. So there's no reward for working with them. Usually it's just best to grab them by the well, throat this, and this do what's necessary. Man, this wonderful man, Lee Oswald, loved his country. And he, since he was in this group that was planning to kill Castro, uh, when he started hearing talk about killing Kennedy, he pretended he hated Kennedy, you know, although privately he's on record, even in the Warren Commission, is saying he admired Kennedy, and they have no motive for this man to kill Kennedy, except saying, oh, he's a loner, he's a loser, he's a nut. Uh, even though you have all kinds of pictures of him smiling, people all around him, they don't show those. They just show him beat up and, and, and wasted, you know, in the end, like he was. It was horrible. Anyway, Lee was able, when he was... Eventually, when the project we worked on failed, uh, Lee was ordered back to Dallas, and he understood this was bad news. He had told me before that he, had, he they didn't trust him ever since he returned from the Soviet Union because he should have returned in a coffin. Since he didn't, maybe he, he couldn't be trusted again. Maybe he had turned, you know, So, because especially he had a Russian wife with him. Well, I could go on a long way, but I'm just saying that Lee Oswald penetrated an assassination ring 
And he said to me when he, we talked until only, I, the last time I saw him was, or talked to him was 37 and a half hours before the assassination. And he, he had already told me, he said, look, I'm not that good. They've invited me into a select, you know, world-class shooting gallery, okay? I, I'm not that good. I, I, see, I can see it, you know. Neither side, he says, I'm no good to either side. Uh, if they were suspecting him, you know, no Russians would ever. Uh, he had a big problem, and he decided that he would stick it out anyway because he said, if I stay, there will be one less bullet aimed at Kennedy. He did everything in his power to try to save the president. And I know that sounds the most absurd thing in the world. And I think one of the reasons I'm alive is how can it be that a 19-year-old is talking about cancer research, you know, and that she's working with all these doctors. But it's documented that uh, we were working on something to kill Castro. Only a couple of years ago, the CIA finally admitted they worked with the mafia to try to kill Castro. It, that, that is formally. It's the first time. You've got Richard Helms saying, telling everyone, when a CIA agent gets up there, they can, they're supposed to lie. So you don't get the truth. They have asked Dulles, they have asked Alan Dulles, imagine, to be in part of the Warren Commission. Here he had been fired by Kennedy and had been, you know, CIA director. I mean, what do you have there, you know? So well, I can terrible. tell you. One of the big uh, yeah. secrets or things that Kennedy did that never gets any coverage is there His was an organization billion. called oh. the World Commerce Corporation. Okay. And World Commerce Corporation was formed by the head of the intelligence agencies, Menzies, Dulles, yeah. Donovan, and so well, Donovan was a friend Stevenson. of Oxner's. Remember, th 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 these people are very close. When you talk about Oxner and Donovan, I mean, they were so close buddies that Donovan was treated in Oxner's hospital trying to save him. Well, what they cancer. did is uh, Kennedy, Kennedy put them out of business. They controlled all world commerce through a company that was registered in Panama. And I read that in one of General Donovan's biographies. It was the only place ever that I've seen. He listed all the people who were involved, the things they did. And Kennedy fired them. He, he destroyed the company. What a man. And, what uh, a great man, this that Kennedy. That put them out of business. Yeah. And I'm sure that didn't go over well. And the fact that it's so hidden and so concealed from history. I think there's only like seven books in the world that ever mentioned World Commerce Corporation existing. There's a great oh. flow chart on the internet where you can see all the people involved in the assassination by the phone calls and contacts they make where they make one and of those And some of these graphs. people, of course, are still alive and they get rewarded. You've got Dan Rather. He was just, he was a reporter from the New Orleans office. And he says, ah, ah, I'm out of breath, but I saw that, you know, there's a Pruder film. I saw Kennedy's head thrown, thrust violently forward. You know, then years later with Jim Garrison, who gets vilified constantly, you see that Kennedy's head was violently thrown backwards. And when this came out in the public, the first thing Dan Rather said before he got to his senses, he said, I must have seen the film backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so so the CIA editing room. And so what happens to him? He goes to the head up, way up high in CBS, and only, you know, in the last few years he's finally been knocked down from that position for doing the usual thing, uh, you know, being found that he was lying. Yes, they all do. Like one of the shows we did past was about, I, you know, I came across the picture of the photographer from Bobby Kennedy's assassination. Oh. And I mentioned on the show, his big regret was he didn't have a flash. And I read that and oh. I fall over and I go, a flash? My big regret would be I didn't have a pump action shotgun to kill the assassin, <laughs> not a flash to take a picture or at least to dive in the way and say, Bobby, look out. Poor Bobby, and, and what a great man there. He also was the photographer who took one of the classic <laughs> photos from the jumper of 9-11, another uh, intel op. So the, you know, these people just come out of the woodwork, and I can't believe anyone could say anything so cruel and callous to say, I watched a man get shot and killed, the hope of our country, a presidential candidate, the brother of an assassinated president, and my only regret is I didn't have a flash. How does he get a job? How does he walk the streets? Why don't people just but pile garbage on him? But those kind do get the him? jobs. Yes. They, they, are, they do have that kind of personality. They, they are that cold and they are that calculating. They've taken the oath to Satan. They get the jobs, but that's okay. No, then you know what? We've got something on our side. So help me, the hand of God has saved my life. Many times. The yes. power is there. You feel it in your oh, bones. Oh, yeah, I do. I, I feel that I, nothing can stop this. I mean, I, even if they shoot my head off, I don't care anymore. You know, I'm, I, in a year and a half, I'm going to be 70 years old. If I, I waited this long because I prayed to God somebody else would speak up. They haven't. The book is out. They're going to they're have to read it and weep. In fact, they have been weeping. 
Well, many of them have. I know when some of my investigations and radio shows, I came across an individual by the name of Frederick Cheney LaRue. Ooh. And a uh, rather dubious fellow, but I found out that he was in control of some banking uh, accounts. One of them involved Richard Nixon and the committee to re-elect the president. And he paid the Watergate burglars. You mean creep. Yes. I, even <laughs> when I was a young man or ch teenager, I guess, back then, I loved that creep. I go, oh, that, that's, <laughs> that's right on the money. It sure was. But he paid the Watergate burglars out of a certain account. But in 1963, he also paid for three Cubans to come to Dallas out of the same account. I did that on four radio shows. Unknown to me is after the second show, he was found dead in Biloxi, Mississippi in a hotel room. Yeah, well, that's and it wasn't happens. until I was completed with this that uh, he got his retirement uh, policy from working for these people because they weren't going to let anybody ever find out or know or come to know that he had access to those bank accounts and that we can draw a line from 1963 take it to the Nixon days and even go further into the modern day and even go right to today and tomorrow, that that line is still drawn. We had a coup d'etat. Oh, we, definitely. We had a, a, an arrangement. And, and, we had a takeover. Even, even Jack Ruby told us this. He said a new government is coming in. And when uh, they asked him, well, Jack, he said, no one will ever know my motives and, and the motives of those who made me, made me shoot. See, he said a little too much, didn't he? And then they said, well, were these people high up, Jack? And he said, yes. It's They're very awful. high up. Something awful. I learned when I was a policeman, I said it as a mistake, I guess, once in my investigator's class, but when you're looking for suspects, they just train you to look down. Sometimes under a lot of pressure, you look across. You're never allowed to look up. And frequently I found the first place to look is up. <laughs> Clear those people, then maybe look across, then look down because because you're, you're poor, talking about who has power then exactly and you, you cut to the chase you see what's going on and you know that uh, like one of the big reasons I used to de debase politicians I love that but I just say you know especially for the ones who claim to be religious I say God says we're all sinners and you say you're a saint someone's lying we're where do I put my money we're all sinners but you know what some of us care and we want to be better we my, my whole goal in life was just to help people. I just wanted to cure cancer. I wanted to do something good for the world. Well, that isn't over yet. There's two things we can do. One is undo the uh, the coup d'etat, and two, get rid of the cancer industry and actually cure people it is from an cancer. That's right. And then you know what? The world's going to be a nice place instead you know, of the if, funny siren. If there's siren, anybody out there, will hire me, put me in a lab. I have kept up with it, uh, everything. I, if I could get into a, what's called a bacteriophage project. Bacteriophage are something you probably have never heard of. Yes. A bacteriophage, are, for example, why is it that you have these sewage treatment plants and, uh, be, and you don't have diphtheria or anything and a lot of viruses that can't be killed by chlorine and so on are get, no, they're killed by bacteriophage, uh, any of this bacteria like diphtheria or something that would come through. Bacteriophage are so simple, such a simple virus that they can be genetically modified to only want to, see they like to eat cells. See, bacteria are little cells, living cells. But we're filled with living cells. Now, you can genetically modify a bacteriophage so that it will go and eat cancer cells. Okay, one minute. But you know what? That's cheap. It's so cheap because once you have that, uh, that kind of thing set up, uh, you, you can't get $200,000 $200, out of a patient. You're only going to get about 20000 out of them. Well, I'd rather see them alive and healthy. We're going to come up to a little yeah. something unusual, too. We're going to... Uh, yeah, because I have a busy schedule. She has a busy schedule, and she's staying with us and uh, helping us through this busy schedule, and we appreciate that. But we're going to do a simulcast with CJAD in Montreal, the uh, Barry Morgan Show. They're going to ask uh, some questions and continue, and we're going to let uh, our guest go to Montreal and then return shortly thereafter with probably some more mundane questions than what we're getting Yeah, there'll at, be general questions, I assume. So that'll that fill in some of the blanks for you, too. Yeah. Are we getting ready, uh, Hugh? And okay. Okay. Yeah, we're ready. Hit okay, the there, hit the ready. button. Go ahead, Judith. Okay, hello. Hi. How are you? Good. So we're just going to be coming into the show now. I'm going to put you on hold again, okay? Okay. They have the commercials. Right. Uh, right now, 11 degrees in downtown.
at all. Uh, if you were caught in the weather, man, I'm sorry for you. Two o'clock. When? Tomorrow? Obviously very nasty. On Saturday. On Saturday. Uh, plenty of on images Saturday. and video this on our website, in... by the way. It's cj.com. Uh, right now, though, okay. as promised, uh, I have on the line with me Judith Vary Baker. She's the author of Me and Lee, How I Came to Know, Love, and Lose Lee Harvey Oswald. It's a 600-page nonfiction autobiography. Uh, first of all, Ms. Baker, thank you so much for joining me. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, for having this me. is uh, quite a piece of work. There's no question about it. It's uh, it's fascinating. I'm extremely intrigued. Then, uh, yeah, then you read the book. You read the book. Then it seems. <laughs> My first question is, how did you meet Lee Harvey Oswald? Okay, it's a it's a common question and a very important one. I met Lee Oswald at a post office in New Orleans. I had come to New Orleans because I had been invited to work in a cancer research project. Uh, unknown to me, I would be accidentally placed on the wrong side of it because one of the people who was working on the clandestine side happened to be, in, uh, it was sponsored by the CIA, had asked for an assistant and because I came two weeks early, they thought it was me. And because I was a female and David Ferry was male, they, they thought, well, they brought a girl so because he's homosexual and there won't be a problem. A little because of a bunch of coincidences, which you can read about in the book, um, I was given information before the doctors came back, so I was forced. They had, they were, they were actually having to confine me to the clandestine side of this. And here I was, up to my, up to my eyeballs, uh, suddenly, in CIA project. Uh, when I thought I was just coming for an internship to work with Dr. Mary Sherman, who was also involved in the clandestine end of it, but I wouldn't have heard about it. Miss so, uh, Baker, so Lee, uh, I'd yeah. really have to get to the heart of the matter as quickly as possible. Yes. And it's your contention that uh, Lee Oswald was an undercover agent who actually got into a ring, infiltrated a ring that was determined to to, uh, to kill President Kennedy yes. and was actually trying to prevent it. But uh, an undercover agent on behalf of whom? Excuse me, what do you mean on behalf of whom? Like who was he oh, working oh, for? He was, he was an undercover oh, agent. Oh, well, uh, he, he, he really was working for the Office of Naval Intelligence, the ONI, and, but he was borrowed by the CIA. They, made a, they had to make a, a, a kind of a barriers because he had returned from the Soviet Union and he had baggage with him as a return spy. So they, they, they wanted to keep some uh, barriers between who was originally sent, who really originally sent him over. Now, when I met Lee Oswald, I was in New Orleans for two weeks ahead of time, and I, I was just a fish out of water. I didn't know what was going on, and, and uh, it was a dangerous city. And we believe that when Lee met me at the post office, he was actually sent to meet me. I didn't know that at the first, but I'll tell you one thing. We clicked right away. You hear that about love at first sight? That's what happened to us. Now, it's your contention very clearly that uh, not only did Mr. Oswald uh, not uh, assassinate JFK, he okay. was trying to prevent it. And you do mention that uh, in the uh, in the book uh, that there are some names uh, of the men responsible That's for right. these assassinations. That's so right. can you tell us who they are or were? Well, we know that Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon knew that the assassination was going to happen. You have... For example, Johnson begging John Connolly, his good friend, not to ride with Kennedy. We have um, a lot of internal evidence about David Atlee Phillips, who was an operations uh, director in the CIA. Uh, for He was just going to be the head of the Mexico City operations. Uh, the same man who said he uh, had pleasure in urinating on Kennedy's grave. Um, that name was given to us. We learned that because Lyndon Johnson was going to have a big problem. Uh, he would actually end up in jail uh, if, if uh, investigations that had been actually promoted by Bobby Kennedy uh, continued. They actually were started right on the 22nd, the day Kennedy died, was shot. Lyndon Johnson knew that he had the choice between cooperating and becoming president or saying, oh, no, we, we can't kill the president and going to jail. So it was a pretty cut and dried thing. We have who a lot the trigger, of... Who pulled trigger, Ms. Baker? Who pulled the trigger? I'll tell you who didn't pull the trigger, and that was Lee Oswald. Now, who pulled the trigger? We know that we had uh, new evidence that's come from the ARRB. You can read about it in Doug Horn's book. Uh, that's, that's after JFK's uh, film JFK came out. 
We have a whole bunch of new evidence that was released. Shows us that Lee Oswald wasn't involved at all. We have a missing president's brain because, you know, if that brain had been present and we could look at it, we'd see the bullet came from the front. But we do have a Zapruder film that shows us the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a tremendous amount of evidence. Who was actually responsible for the actual murder? Well, uh, this is a this is a, a cabal. This is a, a they use the mafia and they use some sharpshooters. We believe that were associated with CIA and and um, what we call uh, mercenaries who were. It's plausible denial, sir. It, they they all had something that would make it possible for them to be blamed all by themselves if they got caught without any connection to the CIA. You have Richard Helms, the director of CIA, saying when he was on the stand, I am going to lie to you, and any CIA officer will, when he was asked about the Kennedy assassination. And I just ask you, who do you trust, the government or the witnesses and someone like Lee Oswald who wrote, uh, if you knew more about him, you'll find out in the book who he was. This man risked his life, and finally he was killed. Are you able to say who gave the order? Well, I wasn't in Dallas, sir. I, well, all I can tell you is what my friend Lee Oswald told me. And he told me that David Atlee Phillips was in charge of it and that Lyndon Johnson was involved because of Bobby Baker and Billy Sol Estes. To and be you specific. mentioned Richard Nixon as well. Nixon was involved also, yes, sir. And we have uh, Murkison, Clint Murkison, who, who uh, is implicated in it. Um, let me see. So, oh, yes, there are a couple of others, too. We have um, John Connolly knew uh, when he was shot, in, uh, when Kennedy was shot in the car before he was shot, he yelled out, my God, they're going to kill us all. That's not the kind of thing you say if, if they're just shooting at you, all of you. It is a fascinating account. There's no question about this, uh, Ms. Baker. Uh, I thank you very much for your time this evening. Well, thank you, and I know it was a short period of time. I just urge all of you to go to the book signing at Paragraph Bookstore near McGill. It'll be at 2 o'clock p.m. tomorrow. I thank you again. Uh, Saturday. Peter. Yeah, thank you. Judith Vary Baker, the author of Me and Lee, How I Came to Know. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. I do my best. It's hard. It's, they'd ask me who to. I wasn't there. How do I know who pulled the trigger? Well, I, I, I got do a, the best I can. I got, I got a few of the, uh, the uh, canceled checks here. So when we were dealing with Frederick Cheney LaRue and who he was paying, the money was yeah. paid to Frank Sturgis. There we go. Yeah. Virgilio I, see, Gonzalez. I know these. I know Sturgis. Uh, Eugenio name. Martinez, Bernard L. Barker, E. Howard Hunt, James Howard, W. McCord. The money was paid right. by a New York cop by well, the name of it. Tony Clausewitz. Okay. Well, I believe that I, I recognize several of those names. Lee knew. Remember, uh, Lee, it's a need to know thing. They try to compartmentalize you so you can't find out who these people are. Exactly. And so it's not fair to say, do you know who pulled the trigger? However, I know, mo I, I know the names. I know people are involved. And by the way, I uh, became friends with Jerry Hemming of Interpen and who was a mercenary who knew all these people as well. Sturgis and Hemming were like that. And uh, Lee had met them and know, knew them and was, for all of their uh, saying, oh, he was a, just a, a jerk or whatever about Lee, they'll say that to save their own skins. But at the time, how did Lee happen to know all these people? Well, he, was in, he had penetrated through the anti-Castro, uh, that's how he did it, through the anti-Castro uh, forces there. And some of them, of course, were turned against Kennedy. And they were a killing machine. They were ready to go. And they were, yes, they were backed by people like Murkison and Big Oil and bankers. Uh, we still have them with us today. They took over America. They blamed an innocent man. And they had to get rid of him right away. Killed him in front of 70 Dallas police officers so he wouldn't talk. I saw it on television. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. They dressed him in a black sweater. There's a backyard photo of him, you know, he's dressed in black and shows a rifle. <coughs> Excuse me. Shows him holding, right? He said, they've pasted my picture. That's not me. I said, I know about, he was good in photography. That man developed his own film, okay? He had some great cameras, like a Cuba camera, a Suera. Uh, he had three-dimensional cam cameras. 
he developed his own film. Yet the backyard photos were developed at a store. Okay? And what really gets me about those backyard photos, it shows him wearing a black shirt and he didn't own a black shirt. I know everything. I Heck, I ironed some of his shirts. I know what he, he wore. He didn't have very many shirts. He had taken a lot of them to Laredo because we were going to get married in Mexico. He, his best clothes. Notice that in his possessions, even though he, he was wearing a black suit when he was at the uh, interviews at the radio talk that was held in New Orleans, that black suit is not even in his possessions that are shown. Um, you know, they show all his possessions. No black suit. Where is it? Well, you know, we all his good clothes were already in a locker in Laredo. We were going to get married. We were going to get away from all of it. We tried. We wanted to escape this. I don't blame you. Yeah, but we couldn't, you know. Destiny yeah. makes strange bed bedfellows. Never dreamed it'd be like that. Just when I just went to New Orleans, I was just supposed to go and enter medical school two years early, and they gave me all these incentives, and instead my whole life was ruined, and Lee's li life was totally destroyed just because he loved his country and he tried to do the right thing. Jim Garrison said of him, he only wanted to be a good Marine. Well, there are good Marines, and uh, you know many of them have changed history and destiny in many battles and many wars. You know, we have a video of a good Marine taking on the NYPD uh, at one of these protests. That's just phenomenal God to bless watch. Him. And he's just telling him, he says, there's no honor in what you're doing. I, if you, if you want to fight, come with me. I'll take you to Afghanistan. But you don't fight unarmed civilians in the it's, United it's States. It's hideous. Uh, how can, and, and of course, you know, when uh, Hillary Clinton was speaking about freedom of speech and everything, this war veteran stands up in, in, in the aisle there, turns his back to her, and he's manhandled. She keeps yes. right on talking, right on talking. He's manhandled that. and carried out, and, and, and he's bruised and, and hurt, you know, from this. I mean, where's our freedom of speech? What happened to ours? Well, we don't have it. Yeah, we, we don't, don't have anything close to well, freedom of speech. Well, we've got freedom of speech right here, but you oh, know yes, what? Oh, yes, you do. After this, after this little spotlight is over, I've got to go back into exile. I have to go back into a life. I, I'm living in an ice cube. I have friends who, who they, they, they hide me. I have to wear a burqa. I live in Turkey part of the time. Um, Americans can no longer live but 30 day, uh, 90 days at a time in the EU. So I have to have residence permits in other countries that are not EU. I, I don't have very many things. I, it's been a very hard life. And I'm just very grateful that I've been able to tell my story and I'm still alive. But after the spotlight's gone, anything can happen. It really can. Because they don't like this. I have living witnesses besides Anna Lewis, who did, recently died. One of them is Mac McCullough. He's a mafia guy. who uh, He was in music and all that. And he said very clearly, they never forget. You know, you're playing with fire. He's on record as saying, I saw the gentleman who's been accused of killing Kennedy with this young woman, you know. And I know they were companions. He saw us a number of times and all that. So I've got my witnesses, and I've got a whole stack of other witnesses. They won't talk at all. They'll write me and say, oh, yeah, I, I saw you two together, you know, but I'm not going to give you my name because I don't want anything bad to happen to me. So what are we going to do? We're going to let the truth die? We're going to have, have those horrible photos of, of Lee, you know, looking like he, he, a thug? He was in a lineup. Imagine this. And I've told people this. They don't realize what Dallas police did. They say, oh, yeah, people recognize him in the lineup. In several of the lineups, he was there beaten, you know, with his, he had T-shirt, his rumpled and a torn shirt. He's got a black eye. He's got a cut on his, on his head. He's got a bruised nose. He looks, he's not shaved. He's not clean. He smells probably by the, who knows. With him are three well-dressed office workers. And... By the way, they could have put two more on the stand. They could have had six people up there and only put three more. You've got a 25% chance right there by just pure chance of choosing Oswald, okay, poorly. But on top of that, they, he had, every one of them had to stand forward and give their name and where they worked. Now, these three men all worked in the police department. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so Lee Oswald stands forth, and it's recorded. My name is Lee. He has to tell it. Yeah, even though it's in the newspapers, it, it's on the news. Texas School Book Depository, Lee Oswald has been arrested. He has to stand forward and say, my name is Lee Harvey Oswald, and I work at the Texas School Book Depository. Did you know that? Did you know that? No. 
Well, it's absolutely the, the absolutely 100% true. Well, I know once I was just scouring for videos about the uh, you know the assassination. I came across one that showed shooters in the building behind the school book depository. And then in 1996, when one of the universities goes to make a, a big uh, exploration into the crime and you know redo the story so it comes out the way the government wants right. it, they make a diagram of Dealey Plaza and they leave out that building. <laughs> so that's like the first thing that, you know, to, wh where did it go? <laughs> There's this giant building behind the school book depository in your diagrams that you're using for your expert testimony, it disappears. Well, yeah, get this too. Uh, there was a thing about the limo, you know, and this was... Um, they drew it, uh, you know, uh, computerized, and they had uh, it animated, and they made all these measurements. And they said, "Hey, we've run out of money. We were only going to make the measurements from the Texas School Book Depository Building. We're not going to try it from Dell Tex. We're not going to try it from any other place. We're not even going to try it from the Grassy Knoll." It's unbelievable. If you're at in Dallas and you're at the the uh, in Dealey Plaza, you're in a fishbowl. And what's really terrifying is it's. Anybody who's standing on the, the, the X there can look up and see it's not a very good shot. They talk about how close it is. It's not that good. No. And if you were in the sixth floor, on the sixth floor, with a rifle, and, and I'm a scientific person, you measure the rifle, you measure the angle, the rifle hits the wall. You can't even make the shot that's necessary with that rifle unless you're standing on your head. I mean, you just there's not room to make it turn enough to to make, because the window wasn't open enough. They only show a partially open window. The window would have had to been open a lot more. So I make measure, I'm a scientific person, I make these kind of measurements. Uh, the, the shot from that window was impossible. I agree. And uh, I think I have a picture of that uh, other building. Well, there's Lee. By the way, they get the tallest people they can find around him. I want to show, I'd like to show you something. Notice that if you had a bigger picture, you'd see that a lot, most of the people behind you, you can't see them because they're as short as Lee. Mm -hmm. But they've put the biggest people around to make them, this is psychological, make them look like a shrimp. Yes, and make, you know, them seem powerful and such. Yeah. So, uh, there, this, this is disgusting. Let me show you something on this. Can I, can I point? Uh, yes. All right. Look, can you see, point? you see that? Well, sort of. You'll have oh, to describe okay. it because he's doing it All on right. the computer. Do you, you see that car? That car there has nobody in front of it. And I mean, when you're watching the Zabruder film, you can't even see another car. That car, other car is sped up. It gets out of the way. He has no protection from the front whatsoever. Now, I'm, look at that light-colored car. You see that light-colored car back there? Yes. Oh, boy, it's not dark like the others. Guess who's sitting in that car? Lyndon Johnson. He doesn't want to get shot at. He makes sure his car is a different color completely. They're not going to make a mistake. You see what I'm saying? And when you look, you don't see anybody sitting on on Kennedy's car. In other photos, you see him in, in, for example, in Tampa, Florida, they're standing on his car. No, they're backwards. Now, a, car, a, a bullet has just been shot, okay? They hear the shot. Are they looking up at the sixth floor no. depository? They're looking straight ahead. They're looking around. They're not looking up. And yet there's a caption with this from the CIA, uh, C, former CIA guy, uh, so, I mean, S Secret Service guy, who, who was, um, around, uh, you know, employed at that time, he said, they're all looking up at the Texas School Book Deposit. No, they are not, not a single one. And if you look further in that picture, oh, sure. oh that's okay, just further in that same Alton's photo, they thought maybe that was Lee Oswald standing in the doorway. What's interesting is that the person next to him is completely blacked out. It's been white washed out, so you can't see that person's face. Some people think that the face of another person was placed over Lee's face and they blocked out his face in the other part. We don't know. And then they would have had to also retouch the shirt to make it look like this other person's shirt. But to me, it, it's very sloppy, and, and I, we know it's been retouched. He may have actually been standing there. We do know that the other person um, uh, was present. Uh, his name is Billy Lovelady, okay? And the Lovelady looked a lot like Lee. But um, there's too much uh, retouching of that photo and fooling around with it. Well, this is uh, one of the classic diagrams, but there this is go. the building they took out. That's the Dell Tex building. They shouldn't. So have if done you're going to shoot, you have a much greater uh, line oh, of yes. fire than you have here than from the school book depository. Yeah, you go up to the sixth floor there of the school book depository. Uh, go down one. You go, move over now to the right. Right. 
That's so, right. Yes. That's where they say you shot from. Make a line now to the X. Okay, go down about where it's, it's, yeah. They think that, all right, now look where the grassy knoll is and where the, they've, they, all right. There, right at G. You can hide anybody there. Look how close that is. Yes, and you're approaching, so you're walking and you've into got, the And you've got fire. seasoned veterans uh, uh, of war, you know. He, he throws his family down because the, whistle, the bullets are whistling over their head. They're right there. They're right there, uh, you know, below the knoll, right closest to Kennedy's car. Poor Kennedy. Notice where it says E. Where That's about where Kennedy, see where E and F are? Where, the other car, the car that's supposed to be in front of him, okay, to protect, you know, for protection and all that, is not even, was never even visible. That's how far ahead it was. It just sped off. Somebody knew something. Definitely. And you have, uh, there are many other things. You've got um, the vice president is in the same cavalcade with the president. That's not supposed to be allowed. And the minute the bullets start, he, he ducks. Now, I'm sure that he had some fear that he might be taken out if he, he too could be taken out if he did not um, cooperate, because we have him talking to Hoover saying, were they shooting at me too, okay? But on the other hand, we have something that's very, very telling, and that is that we have a memo, Katzenbach memo, that says we have to convince the public that Lee Harvey Oswald did this. And this is within days. Even worse, Hoover uh, wrote a scribbled a note on a, something the Dallas police sent saying, we found this odd group here that might have threatened Kennedy, hated Kennedy. We'd like to investigate them along with Oswald. And he said, no, he wrote down, you've got your man. Uh, no need to look anywhere else. And this was the same day that Lee Oswald was arrested, the same day Kennedy was killed. They hadn't even gotten any of the evidence to Washington, D.C. yet. Did you know that? Yes, they do it all the time. Well, that's what happened. So they made up their mind about him. I call it making the shoe fit. Yeah, well, and they, that's what their specialists at. So Lee even Oswald you go back innocent. to many other famous crimes, like the kidnapping of the Lindbergh uh, baby, money that was used, uh, you know, in the yeah. crime was turning up long after they killed the uh, their uh, their patsies, and the police that wanted to yeah. look into it were told no. No, you can't. Uh, you can't look any further. We're talking 9 about evil. We're talking about evil, and, and uh, not only evil, but these people get rewarded for evil. And we, we who are good, who want to make a difference, who want, who want, who want people to have life and love it, and and uh, make this planet a better place, and all that, they don't care about any of that. They only care about power, power, blood, and money, over and over again. Sounds like me in the mirror. <laughs> I talk like that a lot. How are we doing for time, Hugh? We're down to the wrap-up time? Two minutes? One minute? Okay, that finger disappeared fast. So, you know, this is where it's at, people. This is Conspiracy Cafe. We, we don't take any prisoners. We go straight for the, uh, the juggler vein to, to give out what you need to know to save your life, to make it better for you. And uh, there's nothing like this on the planet Earth. You've got the comparison between mainstream media and us, and that's a good comparison on how they try to corner what our guest has to say. We let her say what she thinks and what she feels and uh, to get the truth sure out did. to her best ability because that's what you need. And compliments of some of the people who donate to this show, you get to listen to this. And uh, we're going to make a podcast of this, a special one for you. Maybe he's even going to make a short edited one or something so you can have things for Thank your you. website or take it places, do things with it. Uh, Hugh will do a very nice job to edit this. And uh, on behalf of the planet Earth and uh, everyone who has a sentient mind, we want to thank you for your sacrifices and all the thank things you, you do. It's not been easy, but it's worth it. It's not easy, but, you know, I can feel tingles in my body from the reward of up there, God is smiling oh, yes. on us. The hand of Don't God ever has been forget in this. It. Sa God saved my life a number of times. Mine I didn't too. even believe in God, and I have to. I just have to. So we know who we're really working for, and our yeah. road is paved. And uh, the big thing is, if you follow along with us, everybody's road's going to be paved. Wouldn't you like to live in the world she talked about? No cancer, yeah. no conspiring cabals trying to kill our leaders and change our and, lives. And Lee and make wrote us about slaves. that. You know, he wrote it. He, he wrote something called Athenia. It told about giving the eight votes to the 18-year-olds that you shouldn't have your house taxed. If your house is taxed, it means you never owned it. And you're just in a feudal society. Sounds familiar. Yeah. To and people who uh, love freedom. that uh, they, that uh, everybody should have a free college education, and that 
you know, just basically he was way ahead of his time. Exactly. Tom, and you're way ahead of your time too because you're a trailblazer to finally bring this I'm to I'm telling arrest. you, please, some, you know. Read the book. Yeah, read it. Get angry and remember how the world really works when it's time to put money and somewhere. Or young vote. people, make a difference. You can do it. You've got it in you. I, 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 I just hand it to them because I've had so many wonderful young people. They're going to something called, we have some videos for them. On, it's called Lola 4, the number 4, Lola 4 JVB for LHO. That is Judith Mary Baker, Lee Harvey Oswald. Lola for JVB for LHO. These are YouTube videos. They can see how Lee was framed. They can see the books, the five books or so that tell the story, the truth, that they can count on and trust, and they need to spread the word because this is the basis. Those people who killed Kennedy, they set up this thing, and they're still running it. And we've got to do something to stop it. Well, thank you for doing what you've done. And thank you for coming out tonight and listening. This was a very special broadcast, and we went a long time, and we're going to make a nice package out of it. So we hope you share it with your friends and get it around the planet Earth a zillion times because we can make the difference. You change the channel, we win the war. Thanks for coming out. Thank you very much for coming out. It was a lovely experience. Thank you. And, uh, you know, if you ever got some spare time, I'm sure you can always phone us from uh, wherever you have to be. And if oh, you're no, in town I, again, I do I look will, up. I, I can't do that. You know, I'm going back into hiding. That's um, fine. Because I want to stay alive. Our prayers will follow you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.
silver and gold. That's no. going to be the end. Why do you think that, Sheena Singh, <laughs> joining us here at the We table. go right past the intro with Sheena because yeah, she's, she's, she's a she's a family member gold. here at that. That's channel. what I'm doing. I'm investing in silver and gold. Really? That's going to be the future. After all, the paper money is gone. It'll be silver, gold, and bar.